Hi, as I read this chapter, I would request all of you to please go through your textbooks as well so that your learning and understanding is better. So this is chapter number one, Civics Power Sharing. Overview. With this chapter, we resume the tour of democracy that we started last year. We noted last year that in democracy, all power does not rest with any one organ of the government. An intelligence sharing of power among legislature, executive and judiciary is very important to the design of democracy. In this and the next two chapters, we carry this idea of power sharing forward. We start with two stories from Belgium and Sri Lanka. Both these stories are about how democracies handle demand for power sharing. The stories yield some general conclusion about the need for power sharing in democracy. This allows us to discuss various forms of power sharing that will be taken up in the following two chapters. Belgium and Sri Lanka Belgium is a small country in Europe, smaller in area than the state of Haryana. It has borders with France, the Netherlands, Germany and Luxembourg. It has population of little over 1 crore, about half of the population of Haryana. The ethnic composition of this small country is very complex. Of the country's total population, 59% lives in Flemish region and speaks Dutch language. Another 40% people live in Wallonia region and speak French. Remaining 1% of the Belgians speak German. In the capital city, Brussels, 80% People speak French, while 20% are Dutch-speaking. The minority French-speaking community was relatively rich and powerful. This was resented by Dutch-speaking community, who got the benefit of economic development and education much later. This led to tensions between the Dutch-speaking and French-speaking communities during the 1950s and 1960s. The tension between the two communities was more acute in Brussels. Brussels presented a special problem. The Dutch-speaking people constituted a majority in the country, but a minority in the capital. Let us compare this to the situation in another country. Sri Lanka is an island nation, just a few kilometers off the southern coast of Tamil Nadu. It has about 2 crore people, about the same as in Haryana. Like other nations in the South Asia region, Sri Lanka has a diverse population. The major social group are the Sinhala speakers 74% and Tamil speakers 18%. Among the Tamils, there are two subgroups. Tamil natives of the country are called Sri Lankan. Tamils 13%. The rest, whose forefathers came from India as plantation workers during colonial period are called Indian Tamils. As you can see from the map, Sri Lankan Tamils are concentrated in the north and east of the country. Most of the Sinhala speaking people are Buddhist, while most of the Tamils are Hindus or Muslims. There are about 7% Christians who are both Tamil and Sinhala. Just imagine what could happen in situations like this. In Belgium, the Dutch community could take advantage of its numeric majority and force its will on the French and German speaking population. This would push the conflict among the communities further. This could lead to a very messy participation of the country. Both the sides would claim control over Brussels. In Sri Lanka, the Sinhala community enjoyed an ever bigger majority and could impose its will on the entire country. Now let us look at what happened in both these countries. Majoritarianism in Sri Lanka Sri Lanka emerged as an independent country in 1948. The leaders of Sinhala community sought to secure dominance over government by virtue of their majority. As a result, the democratically elected government adopted a series of majoritarian measures to establish Sinhala supremacy. In 1956, an act was passed to recognize Sinhala as the only official language, thus disregarding Tamil. The governments followed preferential policies that favored Sinhala applicants for university positions and government jobs. A new constitution stipulated that the state shall protect and foster Buddhism. All these government measures coming one after the other gradually increased the feeling of alienation among the Sri Lankan Tamils. They felt that none of the major political parties led by Buddhist Sinhala leaders was sensitive to their language and culture. They felt that the constitution and government policies denied them equal political rights, discriminated against them in getting jobs and other opportunities and ignored their interests. As a result, 
the relations between the Sinhala and Tamil communities strained over time. Kindly go through the map given in the textbook and also the word meanings. The Sri Lankan Tamils launched parties and struggles for the recognition of Tamil as an official language for regional autonomy and equality of opportunity in securing education and jobs. But their demand for more autonomy to provinces populated by the Tamils was repeatedly denied. By 1980s, several political organizations were formed demanding an independent Tamil Ilams, which is state in northern and eastern parts of Sri Lanka. The distrust between the two communities turned into widespread conflict. It soon turned into civil war. As a result, thousands of people of both the communities have been killed. Many families were forced to leave the country as refugees and many more lost their livelihoods. You have read about Sri Lanka's excellent record of economic development, education and health. But the civil war has caused a terrible setback to the social, cultural and economic life of the country. It ended in 2009. Accommodation in Belgium The Belgian leaders took a different path. They recognized the existence of regional differences and cultural diversities between 1970 and 1993. They amended their constitution four times so as to work out an arrangement that would enable everyone to live together within the same country. The arrangement they worked out is different from any other country and is very innovative. Here are some of the elements of Belgian model. Constitution prescribes that the number of Dutch and French speaking ministers shall be equal in central government. Some special laws require the support of majority of members from each linguistic group. Thus, no single community can make decision unilaterally. Many powers of central government have been given to state governments of the two regions of the country. The state governments are not subordinate to the central government. Brussels has a separate government in which both the communities have equal representation. The French-speaking people accepted equal representation in Brussels because the Dutch-speaking community has accepted equal representation in the central government. Apart from the central and the state government, there is a third kind of government. This community government is elected by people belonging to one language community, Dutch, French and German speaking, no matter where they live. This government has the power regarding cultural, educational and language related issues. You might find the Belgian model very complicated. It indeed is very complicated even for people living in Belgium. But these arrangements have worked well so far. They help to avoid civic strife between the two major communities and a possible division of the country on linguistic lines. When many countries of Europe came together to form the European Union, Brussels was chosen as its headquarters. What do we learn from these two stories of Belgium and Sri Lanka? Both are democracies, yet they dealt with the question of power sharing differently. In Belgium, the leaders have realized that the unity of country is possible only by respecting the feelings and interests of different communities and regions. Such a realization resulted in mutually acceptable arrangements for sharing power. Sri Lanka shows a contrasting example. It it shows us that if a majority community wants to force its dominance over others and refuses to share power, it can undermine the unity of the country. Why power sharing is desirable? The two different sets of reasons can be given in favor of power sharing. Firstly, power sharing is good because it helps to reduce the possibility of conflict between social groups. Since social conflict often leads to violence and political instability, power sharing is a good way to ensure the stability of political order. Imposing the will of majority community over others may look like an attractive option in the short run, but in the long run it undermines the unity of the nation. Tyranny of the majority is not just oppressive for the minority, it often brings ruin to the majority as well. There is a second deeper reason why power sharing is good for democracies. Power sharing is the very spirit of democracy. A democratic rule involves sharing power with those affected by its exercise and who have to live with its effects. People have a right to be consulted on how they are to be governed. 
A legitimate government is one where citizens through participation acquire a stake in the system. Let us call the first set of reasons prudential and the second moral. While prudential reasons stress that power sharing will bring out better outcomes, moral reasons emphasize the very act of power sharing is valuable. The meaning of prudential based on prudence or on careful calculation of gains and losses, prudential decisions are usually contrasted with decision based purely on moral considerations. Forms of power sharing The idea of power sharing has emerged in opposition to the notions of undivided political power. For a long time, it was believed that all power of a government must reside in one person or group of persons located at one place. It was felt that if the power to decide is dispersed, it would not be possible to take quick decisions and to enforce them. But these notions have changed with the emergence of democracy. One basic principle of democracy is that people are the source of all political power. In a democracy, people rule themselves through institutions of self-government. In a good democratic government, due respect is given to diverse groups and views that exist in a society. Everyone has a voice in the shaping of public policies. Therefore, it follows that in democracy, political power should be distributed among as many citizens as possible. In modern democracies, power sharing arrangements can take many forms. Let us look at some of the most common arrangement that we have or will come across. Number one, power is shared among different organs of government such as the legislature, executive and judiciary. Let us call this horizontal distribution of power because it allows different organs of the government placed at same level to exercise different powers. Such a separation ensures that none of the organs can exercise unlimited power. Each organ checks the others. This results in a balance of power among various institutions. Last year we studied that in a democracy even though ministers and government officials exercise power, they are responsible to the parliament or state assemblies. Similarly, although judges are appointed by the executive, they can check the functioning of executive or laws made by the legislatures. This arrangement is called a system of checks and balances. Second, power can be shared among governments at different levels. A general government for the entire country and governments at the provincial and regional level. Such a general government for the entire country is usually called federal government. In India, we refer to it as the central or union government. The governments at the provincial or regional level are called by different names in different countries. In India, we call them state governments. This system is not followed in all countries. There are many countries where there are no provincial or state governments. But in those countries like ours, where there are different levels of government, the constitution clearly lays down the powers of different levels of government. This is what they did in Belgium, but was refused in Sri Lanka. This is called federal division of power. The same principle can be extended to the levels of government lower than the state government, such as the municipality and panchayat. Let us call division of powers involving higher and lower levels of government vertical division of power. We shall study these at some length in the next chapter. Third, power may also be shared among different social groups, such as the religious and linguistic groups. Community government in Belgium is a good example of this arrangement. In some countries, there are constitutional and legal arrangements whereby socially weaker sections and women are represented in legislatures and administration. Last year, we studied the system of reserved constituencies in assemblies and the parliament of a country. This type of arrangement is meant to give space in the government and administration to diverse social groups who otherwise would feel alienated from the government. This method is used to give minority communities a fair share in power. In Unit 2, we shall look at various ways of accommodating social diversities. Fourth, power sharing arrangements can also be seen in the way political parties, pressure groups and movements control or influence those in power. In a democracy, the citizens must have freedom to choose among various contenders for power. 
In contemporary democracies, this takes the form of competition among different parties. Such competition ensures that power does not remain in one hand. In the long run, power is shared among different political parties that represent different ideologies and social groups. Sometimes this kind of sharing can be direct. When two or more parties form an alliance to contest elections, if their alliance is elected, they form a coalition government and thus share power. In a democracy, we find interest groups such as those of traders, businessmen, industrialists, farmers and industrial workers. They also will have a share in governmental power either through participation in governmental committees or bringing influence on the decision-making process. In Unit 3, we shall study the working of political parties. Here are some examples of power sharing. Which of the four types of power sharing do these represent? Who is sharing power with whom? The Bombay High Court ordered the Maharashtra state government to immediately take action and improve living conditions for the 2,000 odd children at seven children's home in Mumbai. The government of Ontario, state and Canada has agreed to a land claim settlement with the Aboriginal community. The minister responsible for the native affair announced that the government will work with Aboriginal people in a spirit of mutual respect and cooperation. Russia's two influential political parties, the Union of Right Forces and the Liberal Yabloko Movement, agreed to unite their organizations into a strong right-wing coalition. They proposed to have a common list of candidates in the next parliamentary elections. The finance ministers of various states in Nigeria got together and demanded that the federal government declare its sources of income. They also wanted to know the formula by which the revenue is distributed to various state governments. Thank you. I hope you like this audiobook. And if you do, do share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel. Thanks you once again.